Yeah, you can trust them. They're the Teen Titans. No, we're not. Oh, right. They're the Young Justice League of America. No, we're young, but just us. Oh, okay, Young Justice. No, young, just us. Right, Young Justice. Fine, whatever. <laughs> Welcome back and welcome to the bonus episode of Me and My Friend Pete where we dig into the high society long boxes and pull comic stories for the ages from all across the multiverse of comic books. This week, we're running through Young Justice number one, Young Just Us, starring the future of the DC Universe. Plays need players and this one has three of the coolest heroes to ever lace up boots to put themselves between the people and the danger. The train's leaving the station and Impulse is always impatient so we won't say soon, we'll start now. First up, we've got none other than a teen of steel himself, Connell, better known as Connor Kent, better known still the world over as Superboy. Superboy first appeared in Adventures of Superman number 500 in June of 1993. He's 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighs 150 pounds with blue eyes and black hair. Superboy's life began with the end of Superman's. After Superman was killed by the Kryptonian monster Doomsday, samples of his DNA were taken by Cadmus Labs in an effort to clone the Man of Steel. Many clones were attempted, but Superboy was the only one to survive after Superman's Kryptonian DNA was grafted onto a strand of human DNA, making him a Kryptonian-human hybrid. So Superboy is the very definition of a test tube baby. After realizing Dr. Paul Westfield, the scientist who cloned him, wanted to use Superboy's powers for his own ends, y'all know how I feel about that. Superboy was rescued from Cadmus Labs by the Newsboy Legion, a group of clone newsies from the 1940s, and introduced himself to the world, first as one of four beings claiming the mantle of Superman, and then as the Man of Steel's protege and adopted cousin upon Superman's return to the world of the living. Originally, Superboy had no name apart from his superhero moniker, but after Superman escorts him to the Fortress of Solitude for the first time, Superboy witnesses the life and death of Superman's Kryptonian cousin, con and after Superman tells him he considers him family, accepts the name as his own. Upon moving in with Superman's Earth parents, Jonathan and Martha Kent, he adopts the Earth name, Connor Kent. Despite having many of Superman's powers now, originally, Superboy only had one, tactile telekinesis. I'd go into it in depth, but man, if the kid didn't brag about it early and often when first starting out. Along the way, he gained a host of other powers. Strap in, we're gonna be here a while. To go along with the big three, Superboy has super senses, stamina, intelligence, endurance, reflexes, Self-sustenance, meaning he doesn't have to eat or sleep, invulnerability, slowed aging, heat vision, x-ray vision, micro and telescopic vision, electromagnetic spectrum vision, freeze and wind breath, flight, molecular acceleration, and solar energy absorption. And although it's not a superpower, Superboy's got style. So he right forewent now. the classic cape Superman wore, despite keeping the blue shirt and red and yellow symbol for hope on his chest, and wore red tights and gloves, black boots, aviator shades, and a leather motorcycle jacket, almost as resilient as he is. I've never been a huge fan of the Man of Steel, but his extended family, Superboy and Supergirl specifically, have always been near to my heart. Next up, we've got the third boy wonder, but first on my list, none other than Timothy Jackson Drake, better known as Robin. Tim Drake first appeared in Batman number 436 in August of 1989, so he's an August baby like me and Pete. He's five foot five and weighs 125 pounds, and like every other Robin except for Stephanie Brown, has black hair and blue eyes. Unlike every other Robin, Tim Drake's induction into the Bat universe didn't start with tragedy, at least not his own, despite absorbing his fair share once he became Robin. On the night Dick Grayson's parents were murdered, Tim was actually in attendance at the circus, even getting a photo with the Flying Graysons before what would be their final performance. Barely old enough to walk, he watched mesmerized as Batman swooped down from the shadows to comfort a young Dick Grayson after his parents were killed a memory that would stay with him for the rest of his life. After the death of Jason Todd, the second Robin, Batman descended into darkness and became more ruthless and violent. Tim, watching from the sidelines, believed that this was because the Batman didn't have a Robin 
and took it upon himself to rectify this. A natural born sleuth with wealth at his disposal, his parents were wealthy. He used both of these gifts to deduce that Batman was Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson was the first Robin. He approached the two with this information and despite Batman's initial reluctance, convinced the Dark Knight to train him as his new boy wonder. And trained him the Batman did. He sent the boy overseas to learn the martial arts, a skill the young Tim, unlike every other Robin, isn't naturally gifted in despite training in the arts before even joining up with the Cape Crusader. And overseas, the kid went to work. I wouldn't consider him a master of any martial art, but that doesn't mean you can take him in a fight. He's well versed in Aikido, Kung Fu, Jeet Kune Do, Eskrima, Nightwing's preferred fighting style, Krav Maga, Taekwondo, Judo, Wing Chun, Hapkido, Karate, Savate, Kendo, Ninjutsu, Tai Chi, Leopard Kung Fu, and Bagua. Unlike other Robins, he regularly employs the use of a bow staff, and maybe that's why he originally was my favorite. Donnie is my favorite Ninja Turtle, and just like Donnie, what the kid lacks in fighting prowess, he makes up for in brains. He is leagues above the rest of the Robins, and second to only Barbara Gordon in intelligence amongst the wards of Batman. A highly capable forensic scientist and criminologist, he uncovered both the Flash and Superman's secret identities without being told. He's a skilled biologist, engineer, and geneticist, and speaks several languages including German, Spanish, Russian, and Cantonese to name a few. His skills at deduction are so great, Ra's al Ghul, one of Batman's greatest foes, refers to him as the detective, a moniker once exclusively held by Bruce Wayne alone. Recently, Tim Drake realized he was bisexual in comics, and I want to take a moment to address the quote-unquote outrage it has garnered. I remember telling a friend upon the announcement of the Black Panther movie that representation is so important. We all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. My love of comic books came from my own similarities with my favorite hero. A murdered father, raised by an elderly woman struggling to provide, often the subject of humiliation and butt of the joke amongst my peers, it brought me great joy to know that someone out there reflected that. Spidey's a fictional character, of course, but I always kept in the back of my mind that his stories were told by people who may have had similar experiences. A lot of the traits I adopted to cope with my feelings of alienation came from Spider-Man. Brazenness bordering on arrogance, willingness to try despite the odds seemingly never being in my favor, a corny sense of humor that seems to be pitch perfect when needed most, and a refusal to back down against bigger and stronger people. Seeing what I viewed as the negatives about me being cast aside when Pete darned that red and blue gave me the delusional belief that I could do the same. His stories matter to me, and still do, because they made me feel seen. His voice made me feel heard, even more so when Miles Morales burst onto the scene. Comic books have always been a genre of subversion, and despite what a superhero looks like, they are written oftentimes by those of us marginalized in society. People of color, immigrants, women, the LGBTQ plus community, the handicapable, etc. How long should they tell stories that ignore their existence? How long have you? We all have a right to see ourselves in our heroes, but more importantly, we all, in my opinion, have an obligation to see our differences in them as well. To learn that it isn't one race or class or creed or whatever that can change the world, but anyone willing to be brave when the moment calls for it and put themselves between the people and the danger. There are people who struggle with being themselves, who at times feel like they have no voice in the larger world. Comics have given so many people that, and usually at an age when all they hear and see are what people deem as flaws in their very existence. All that said, there is nothing wrong with being a person of color, a woman, non-cis in your sexual orientation, and on down the list. We are all uniquely similar and similarly unique. There is nothing wrong at all with Tim Drake being bisexual. If you feel there is, that says everything about you and nothing about Tim Drake or anyone else who chooses to be what they want and love who they choose without hurting anyone else in the process. Because representation is so important and if you're willingly stepping into a world where you have to suspend disbelief and see a 15 year old kid with spider powers pummel dudes with eight limbs or an alien immigrant being the living symbol of America who constantly battles to protect his adopted home, in my opinion, there should be no reason why you can't accept in those worlds of fantasy reflections of people who actually exist in the real world. And if you're outraged like so many are, and you don't even love or support the genre of comic books, you're just setting yourself up as another pawn in a system of control meant to make us believe that being different means our existence is wrong inherently. Conformity should begin and end with respect for your planet and the living things that dwell within it. Believe me when I say, if that outraged person sounds like you, you don't belong here. If you choose to stay, accept that human existence is as singular and vivid as the color red and as unique in its totality as the rainbow. Step outside of your comfort zone. 
You may just learn a thing or two about the world you've never known, and you don't know what you don't know. Because bigotry and hatred, in the words of the Black Panther, we don't do that here. And the ones who do are always the villains. Back to. We're moving on to our final spotlight. A member of my favorite comic book family and the brashest youngster to come out of comics since the kid from Forest Hills, Queens. I'm talking about none other than Bartholomew Henry Allen II, but you can just call him Impulse. Impulse made his first cameo appearance in The Flash number 91 and his first full appearance the following month in The Flash number 92. Bart Allen is the grandson of Barry Allen and the son of Melanie Thawne, a descendant of The Flash's greatest enemy, Eobard Thawne, the Reverse Flash. The Flash is my favorite DC superhero and even I can't keep the convolution of the story straight. But apparently, the Allens and Thorns have a family rivalry that makes the Herb Clanton beef look like a fistfight in a preschool sandbox. A truce was called sometime before Bart was born in the 30th century where his grandfather was President Thorn. Bart was born with his super speed and because of it, was aging at an accelerated rate. By the time he was two years old, he resembled a 12 year old. His grandfather, hoping to save his life, put Bart in a virtual reality simulator where his rapid aging slowed, allowing the young Bart to learn about the world at the speed in which he lived it. But President Thawne had sinister intent. His true motive was to allow Bart to age to an adult and send him back in time to wreak havoc on the Allen family. Bart's grandmother, Iris, Barry's wife, kidnapped Bart and took him into the past, leaving him in the care of Wally West, her nephew and Flash at the time, who fixed Bart's aging problem with a race around the world. Growing up in a simulation, Bart never knew the concept of fear and doesn't feel it often, usually the first to put himself between the people and the danger when the pressure's on. Because of this rashness, he took the code name Impulse, which first he gave to himself, but that was retcon and he was given the name by Batman as an insult. Bart must not have learned cynicism while in the virtual world because he loved the name and it stuck. Now in the 20th century, Bart set out to live up to the legacy of the great heroes that came before him in the Flash family while trying to carve out his own place within the heroic legacy. And as the fastest kid alive, he may just outstrip them all. Impulse's power set include, like most Flashes, immense super speed, stamina, reflexes, reaction time, agility, durability, endurance, perception, metabolism, conditioning, dexterity. He can vibrate fast enough to make himself intangible or invisible. He has some control of the speed force lightning, making him able to control electricity. His aging is slowed. He can time travel. He has a healing factor, an enhanced immune system. He can create vortexes, usually by spinning his arms rapidly. He is resistant to telepathy and is tapped into the speed force, making him immune to changes in the time stream. Unlike every other Flash, Bart has an eidetic or photographic memory, giving him total recall over his memory, a trait he puts a good use in his final appearance as Impulse and first as Kid Flash, when he reads every book in the San Francisco Public Library in one sitting, gaining knowledge far beyond his years despite not having the wisdom to always use it appropriately. Did I miss anything? Oh yeah. He's 5'2 and 115 pounds with brown hair and yellow eyes. Yeah, yellow eyes. As far as Flash looks go, his is the coolest. We've got the player. No, 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 there's one more hero. What? Who? The whirling dervish himself. Oh, right. My people, we're almost there. I present to you, John Smith. The Red Tornado. John Smith, the second Red Tornado, made his first appearance in Justice League of America number 17 in February of 1963. He's six feet tall and 325 pounds with no eyes and no hair. Red Tornado is a living, well, tornado, once known as the Tornado Tyrant from the planet Ran, who traveled to Earth where he was captured and housed in an android body by Justice League villain T.O. Morrow, who hoped to use him to destroy the Justice League. But Red Tornado turned on Morrow and joined the League instead. He built a life on Earth. He married a woman named Kathy Sutton and adopted an orphan girl named Treya and has had a long and storied career as a member of the Justice League. His powers include the ability to generate his namesake, tornadoes, and limited control over the weather. I don't know much about the Red Whirlwind, but I know he's responsible for one of my holy crap, holy did you see that moments in comics history. As a veteran Justice League member surrounded by rookies, he and the inexperienced team found themselves tasked with stopping the usually witless man monster, Solomon Grundy. You may know him. He was born on a Monday. Grundy, reborn each time he's killed, came back as a genius and with his already superhuman strength and durability, now combined with his intelligence, you gotta know that meant trouble. He tricked the Red Tornado into inhabiting a human body before ripping the tornado's arm off and eating it in front of him. In the climactic moment of the battle, Red Tornado whips up winds upwards of 250 miles an hour as Grundy advances on him. Realizing the undead behemoth won't stop coming, Reddy turns up the winds to 350 miles an hour and Grundy, unable to move through the gale force, plants his feet, 
claiming to be an unmovable object. And that's true. His feet don't move, but they don't need to. The winds literally rip him in half from the waist up, ending the threat of the intelligent Solomon Grundy, who of course was born on a Monday. Now we've got the players. Let's get to the play. Me and my best friend Pete, old adventures, new critiques. He spins webs, I spin yarns, kinda kooky, be forewarned. Look out, it's me and my friend Pete. Writing on this one, we've got Peter David with pencils by Todd Nauk, inks by Larry Strucker, Jason Wright on colors, Digital Chameleon is responsible for separations, Ken Lopez did letters, and Eddie Berganza was the editor. On the cover of this number one issue, we have the title, Young Justice and Goldenrod, with a red orange see-through outline beneath it. In the background, in a cave, there is a large monitor screen stage right, casting a television blue glow on the walls and circular table in front of it. At the center of this table, three letters sit superimposed on a shield, J-L-A. And there are pizza boxes, chips, and spill drinks covering it. Racing up from this table, we see young, just, us, rising from the ground to meet us. On stage left, we get Robin, his name next to his head in its stylized form in a matching goldenrod. He's wearing a red shirt with green short sleeves padded on the biceps, green gloves that extend to his elbows padded on the forearms, green tights, black boots, and a cape that's black on the outside and yellow underneath. On his eyes, he's wearing his green domino mask with mirrored lenses. On his chest above his heart is a yellow R for Robin, superimposed on a black circle. Between his pectorals, there are four horizontal yellow bars. He's got a white boy fade with low cut hair on the sides and he's holding a line probably shot from his grapple hook as he pulls himself off the floor and towards us. Next to him, stage right, we get Superboy. He's wearing his signature black leather jacket with the classic Superman blue and red and yellow S shield. He's wearing red tights and gloves with a yellow band wrapping his right thigh and black calf length boots. In his left ear, there's a gold hoop earring. He's rocking a white boy fade too, but the sides of his head are bald. He's got his right fist extended towards the ceiling and his left pulled back at the elbow. His left knee raised and his right straight in the classic Superman flying into danger pose. Finally, as Robin swings and Superboy flies, Impulse is running up the cave wall, lightning trailing him in a white and red one-piece costume that extends to his chin. The white is running down his arms and outer legs. The red, in the symbol of a lightning bolt, runs down his chest from his collarbone, past his thighs, towards his running boots. He's got red framed goggles on with golden rod lenses. His hair is just a mass of brown. His right cheek is filled with food and two french fries poke out of the left side of his mouth. In his right hand, he's holding a yellow and orange box of fries labeled lots of fries. And in his left, a blue fast food cup with a yellow label and straw that reads Mondo Gulp. A lot of people struggle with walking and chewing bubble gum at the same time. Impulse doesn't have that problem. Robin and Superboy both look very serious, but not Impulse. He's gonna eat and run, literally. Let's get into it. Page one opens with a splash and a caption box. The horror. And in an alley surrounded by tall buildings in the dead of night stands Batman in his outfit dubbed The Detective. This is his gray and black outfit with the bat symbol and a yellow oval at the center of his chest and his old school utility belt that isn't pouches. It's my favorite bat costume. But something's wrong with Batman. His skin is ashen and his hands are clawed fingers as he stands staring down at the boy wonder. Robin is on both knees his mirrored lenses wide with fear, his skin tinged gray as well, and on the ground in front of him, being swarmed by water bugs, is his gloved left hand. His left wrist is bandaged in white gauze, and in place of his hand is a battering as he screams exactly what's happening. His hand is being eaten by cockroaches. Granted, Batman is always calm, but his response is off. He says, Don't worry, Robin. No one will notice. By the way, have you ever considered growing a beard? A subtle nod to Arthur Curry, the king of Atlantis, Aquaman. Page two, we get another splash in the same caption box. The horror. But now, it's Superboy flying high above Metropolis in an orange sky. The buildings warp behind him as Superman flies up to meet him in his classic flying pose. Superboy, never needing assistance to fly, has sprouted two large fiery wings out of his back and he is freaked out by the addition. Again, his mentor seems nonplussed with this strangeness. Superman says, it was inevitable, Superboy. That's what happens when you're so holier than thou. And I think Superman using the word inevitable is a subtle nod to the X-Men's Phoenix Force. The Phoenix is inevitable. And page three, we get more of the same strangeness. My God, the horror. As Impulse has run from the bottom of the splash page stage right. Behind him, in his afterflash, as I call it, the golden slipstream that usually follows all DC speedsters as they run, there are images of him, but they're all strange. 
He's in a tuxedo in the first after image, then his impulse costume, then in a red jumpsuit holding a mop, then in reverse flash gear. He's dressed as Han Solo next with white shirt, black vest, black pants with a red stripe running down the out scene, then back in his impulse costume as a blue skinned Hulk screaming, Impulse not know who Impulse is anymore. Puny humans, Impulse will flash. He's in a zoot suit next as he says, In clothes, personality, it is getting so... Then a brown cardigan holding a smoking pipe before finally his normal appearance as he tries to leap from the panel screaming what's happening and that he's going through high speed changes. Page 4 opens with all three heroes in side by side panels, Impulse, then Supes, then Robin, all screaming with cold sweat beating on their foreheads. In the final panel, the camera zooms out and we see all three in sleeping bags set up on the floor of the cave from the cover. They stare at each other, not speaking, Robin turning on a lantern in the darkness. We get an ad for one free ticket to Six Flags next, I wonder if that's still good. And a bunch of cereals from General Mills. Right now there is a huge beef going on with Kellogg's and its workers. I personally don't understand how a food company doesn't pay its employees enough to actually eat a decent meal. So boycott Kellogg's. The next page we get another ad, this time for Tangent Comics, which has the biggest names in comics in quote, nine world shaking specials, raising the stakes this July. This seems interesting. I never really saw this in a comic book store as a kid, but then you all know what I was looking for. Back to Robin's the first to speak on page five and he asked the other two teens if they had bad dreams. Superboy hops up from the floor and as conceited as ever, begins combing his hair in the foreground of the next panel, saying that he has no problems, he's fine. Impulse, behind him, running both hands through his own hair, says he slept like a log. When Superboy says logs don't sleep, Impulse replies, Oh yeah? Ever see one walking around? Quipping! In the next panel, Robin, rubbing the back of his neck with his right hand, shows his character and vulnerability. He says they're lucky because he had a bizarre nightmare. I was turning into someone unrecognizable. Grim, gritty, depressing, as if some maniacal power was doing terrible things to me just to serve some demented whim. Impo says, sure, whatever, and we get a great thought bubble of a screw next to a baseball in his head. What do you think? Screwball! And Impo is a kid after my own heart. His hair slipped back, he says he agreed to join this group, but now it's boring and they need some before his hair springs back to its normal tousled position in the final panel and he finishes his sentence with one word. Action. Meantime, as fate in parallel story construction would have it, at a convenient archaeological dig not far away, page six opens to a group of archaeologists at a dig site surrounded by standing lights. There are green tents set up, wooden sawhorses with yellow and black caution tape wrapping them, and a brown pickup truck also surrounding the dig site. Sitting on top of a brown chair, we get a strawberry blonde haired woman in a green vest, white t-shirt, brown shorts, blue tinted glasses, and construction boots. A tape recorder held in her right hand, she speaks into it saying she's Nina Dowd. This is day 18 of their excavation, and she's convinced the crater they're excavating is the result of an extraterrestrial object striking the spot several thousand years ago. In the next panel, she continues as the camera zooms in tight, saying she has a feeling that today, they're going to hit pay dirt. Of course, Cosmic and Comic Timing intervene as one of her assistants shouts up to her from the pit that she better get down into it because they found something. She jumps into the pit in the next panel, joining a blonde haired woman named Murph in a black blazer and matching pants with a sky blue shirt holding a camera and a brown haired man in a brown shirt. Murph says they found something. Her word balloon stresses into the final panel describing it for us. It's a wheel with a tire and everything and I'm reasonably sure it's attached to something. The wheel is half uncovered. As Dow slides into the pit to open page 7, Murph kneels down to snap photos saying this could be the biggest discovery since Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was an archaeological find by amateur archaeologists Charles Dawson in February of 1912 and Piltdown, Sussex. At the time of his discovery, the skeleton was considered to be the missing link between modern man and our first ancestor from half a million years ago. This archaeological find caused a 41 year debate over its authenticity until advancements in the field of archaeology and human biology ended the debate completely. The Piltdown Man was a forgery. Many believe that English nationalism was responsible for the four decades of hotly contested debate and if you heard the main episode this week where I tore into Tarzan, I don't doubt it. In one of the many Tarzan books, a race of white men are discovered in Africa that predated what the majority of the scientific community believed, making them the original man and not an African or Asian as generally believed. The point I'm getting at here is, even scientists lie to satisfy their own egos and thoughts of their racial superiority. Fun fact, Africa can fit the entirety of North America in the Sahara Desert, 
but it is only barely larger than North America on every map I've ever seen. There is a reason for that. However, despite this lunacy, racists in the field, until they have indisputable proof to the contrary, will always have to live knowing that the oldest anatomically modern human remains were found in North Africa in what is now Morocco and are dated at around 300,000 years old and the only remains that have a chance of being in the same category were found in West Asia and what is now Turkey down the list. In fact, the oldest European remains don't make the top 10 or even top 15 of this list. They come in at around number 20. A true scientist would marvel at the human ability to migrate from the mother continent and throughout the world. An ethnocentrist would try to rewrite history, erasing the fact. Remember, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Thank you, stratigraphy and carbon dating. Back to Dow knows her history. She says the pill down man was a hoax as she approaches the half uncovered tire in the next panel. Taking a better look at the tire, she says the rubber doesn't look like modern rubber at all, but another substance completely and reaches out a hand. Mer says Dow shouldn't touch the tire because the woman doesn't know where it's been. But Dow doesn't listen. She places her left hand on the wheel in the next panel saying, don't be absurd, it's a relic. What could possibly? Of course there's an explosion and all three people are cast in shadow as a blinding yellow light shoots out from the tire. In the final panel, Murph, a red fingernailed hand to her blonde hair, screams for someone to call the authorities. When Brown Shirt asks which one, Murph replies, all of them. We turn the page and we're on the infinity, the infinity, 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 infinity page. Page eight, just in time to be back outside of the cave of former JLA HQ. As someone screams, they think things are going fine. I assume it's Robin. We get back inside and he's standing at the center of the page, his arms wide, impulse in the background doing flips, playing with the JLA computer, and leaping off banisters. The kid is all over the place. Robin's pleading his case to Superboy, who's standing in the foreground, stage left with his back to Robin, arms folded, in front of a statue of the Red Tornado. Tornado is red, head to foot, with a yellow circle on his chest, cut through by a large red T, and a yellow arrow running from the back of his head to the front its point ending in an arch above his eyebrows. He's also sporting a large blue cape with a high collar and yellow trim. It's a gorgeous cape, held on his neck by a fine piece of twine. And Robin continues. He says it may be boring, but they were hanging out to get to know each other and were having such a good time that they stayed in a cave for an impromptu sleepover and adds that it's too early in their team's career to be complaining about inaction. You see, Tim Drake knows the second rule of me and my friend Pete never court violence. But then again, he's the only kid in the room without power, so I get it. He's had to live in a world where things aren't one constant battle, but Superboy doesn't care. Jerking his head at the statue of Red Tornado, he says he's not like the statue behind him and that there are a ton of options in the world for a guy like him and that waiting around with Robin and a human flick gun, as he calls Impulse, isn't floating his boat. Robin walks over to a giant computer screen saying he'll take monitor duty, to which Superboy replies, whoopee freaking do. Superboy said he's bored, and Robin's response is to get more boring. Impulse runs up to the two in the next panel, showing them a white spray paint can with dry blue spray paint wrapping the top of the can. He says he found the can, and he wants to decorate. Robin screams no, but it's already too late. The fastest kid alive is already a blur, his after flash painting the walls of the cave. Superboy is just able to activate his tactile telekinesis, and the sky blue spray paint aimed at him bounces off, splattering across Robin's face. On page 9, we get a glimpse of Impulse's handiwork. On the roof of the cavern, he's painted rough sketches of the trio with the words, we rule, in the middle. But he didn't stop there. On the chest of the Red Tornado, he's also written two words, Hanson Bites. Hanson is an American pop trio composed of brothers Isaac, Taylor, and Zach Hanson. And the trio have sold more than 16 million records worldwide with three top 20 albums here in the States. They were the Jonas Brothers before the Jonas Brothers and are best known for their hit single, Mmm Bop from their debut album that received three Grammy nominations. I thought Hanson made good music, but I'm not a fan anymore as one of the brothers has viewpoints of the world that I'll never agree with. And I actually have a Hanson Christmas story. In junior high, the kids in my class did a Secret Santa every year, which always got under my skin because I was a poor kid and didn't have money to buy gifts. Once, no lie, I cleaned an Ernie of Ann Burt fame, doll I had, scrubbed it, blow dried it, did his hair and everything because I didn't have the cash to get the girl whose name I chose a gift. That's a true story. Another year, I drew another girl's name from the Secret Santa. A girl who had to be the biggest Hanson fan in the universe, which to me at the time was the South Bronx. I spent a whole month trying to figure out how I'd get the 14 bucks to get her Hanson's album before deciding I'd just buck up and tell her I tried. But I would spend the weekends with my mom during that year and my mom, like me, loved music 
and I'd rummage through her CD collection to find things to listen to. One weekend, in the days leading up to Christmas break, I was doing just that to put some background music on while I assembled a model car my mom got me, and what did I find on her bookshelf between I Shit You Not, Tupac Shakur, and Boys to Men? Middle of Nowhere, Hanson's first official studio album. My mom let me have it, of course, and the smile on that girl's face when she unwrapped it made me feel like the king of the world. You know what I got that Christmas for Secret Santa from a man I still consider a friend named Luis Lopez? An action figure of none other than THE Amazing Spider-Man that has strings connected through his wrist for full-on web-swinging action. So shout out to that woman and shouts out to Lou. He didn't even know I loved the webhead. That's what you call divine intervention. But Impulse is right, at least by a third. Hanson bites. Back to. In the next panel, Superboy jerking his thumb towards himself calls Impulse a dope and says the kid's lucky he can take the spray paint off of his tactile telekinesis while Robin, scrubbing the spray paint from his face, says, yeah, right, lucky. Impulse, smiling with every tooth, says, sure, but asks if the place looks cooler. Superboy flies up to the roof to check out the artwork and admits the place does look cooler, while Robin goes full-on mother hen. For crying out loud, we're being loaned this meeting space by the JLA. Don't you get that? We can't just trash it however we see fit. How are we going to function as a team if we don't have respect for other teams? Impulse, already past this moment and on to the next one, grabs the statue of the Red Tornado and placing it horizontally on the JLA tabletop, pretends to surf it saying maybe they shouldn't be a team then. Superboy agrees. He says the trio have nothing in common before a fourth voice enters the room. The reanimated Red Tornado speaks, causing Impulse to jump and fall off of him. And Reddy says, Perhaps if you approach the matter from Freudian psychoanalytic terms. On the floor staring up at the android to open page 10, Impulse says he thought the android was a statue, and Robin feigns surprise that Impulse actually thought for once. Unfazed, the Red Tornado shows he's a fan of psychology in the next panel and starts monologuing. The three of you actually fit the Freudian archetypes of id, ego, and superego. His speech continues into the next panel, a panel of Impulse wearing an inquisitive expression, while above his head, we get a great shot of him running as first a chubby toddler, and then his teen self wearing a VR helmet. You, Impulse, are from a future where your development was hyper-accelerated, and you grew up through computer games. You have no concept of danger or mortality. You are pure living id, all instinct, no before or afterthought. Next, Superboy looking nonplussed as an image of him in his test tube plays above his head. Superboy, you are a clone raised artificially with developmental knowledge that was not experienced firsthand. You are ego, with a grasp of morality and ethics capable of making basic judgment calls. And in the final panel, we see Robin, his head lowered, while above it, an image of him and the Batman play in front of a full moon. Robin, you are the latest assistant to the Batman, and the only one here to have anything approaching a normal boyhood. You have a highly developed moral sense and are the most natural leader. You are super ego. We get an old school ad for the Fruitopia drink next. Do you people remember Fruitopia? It's one of those ads where you have to connect the arrows from A to the arrows from B on opposite sides of the page like a Mad Magazine and it makes the drink. I'm glad I didn't fold that over. This is a number one. We get an ad for Jack Kirby's New Gods. Yes, the very same Jack Kirby of Fantastic Four fame. Jack Kirby is the world building master. In the big two, nobody has been more influential as a whole. Jack Kirby is that guy. Back to Red Tornado in the center of the panel with his back to us to open page 11. Listens to Superboy who's standing stage right as Robin looks on stage left. And Superboy is pissed. More cool than brains. He says why isn't he super ego proving he wasn't paying attention at all. Or as my nanny used to say, he hears what he wants to hear. He goes on to say that he's super and Robin is the boy ego. Robin, ignoring the boy of steel's hissy fit, Ask what the Red Tornado is doing here. And Reddy continues, switching from psychology to a field I'm familiar with, sociology. Reddy shut himself down, and this actually plays to Emil Durkheim's theory of the four types of suicide. Durkheim posits that there are four reasons people commit suicide, and all of them have to do with society because our walls, our limits, are other people. This is straight from my notes. Balance in society comes from a balance in the regulation of that society and the attachment and individual feels being a part of the society. Shorter, regulation, and attachment. The first type of suicide is altruistic suicide. Altruistic suicide occurs when social regulation and social attachment are both high. When a person is so weaved into the fabric of their society personally, they'll give their lives for it. Examples of this are the pilots of the 9-11 attacks 
and kamikaze fighter bombers during World War II. The next is fatalistic suicide, and this occurs when regulation of society is high and attachment is low. An example of this is touched on in the Black Panther movie when Killmonger, played by Michael B. Jordan, is defeated by T'Challa, played by the legendary Chadwick Boseman, with a hell of a move and told by T'Challa that he could possibly be saved. Killmonger replies, why? So you could just lock me up? No, just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships because they knew death was better than bondage. Every one of my ancestors that jumped overboard during their passage through the Triangle Slave Route chose fatalistic suicide over the horrors they knew they'd face in the new world. That's fatalistic suicide. There is no future in this society for me, so I'm opting out. Next we have anomic suicide. Anemic, anomic, I can't remember how it's pronounced. Nomi means normlessness. This occurs when there's low social regulation, but high attachment to society. And this happens when there is a sudden drastic change in a person's life that they can't overcome, that society doesn't help with, and they are not able to get back to their normal way of life. A perfect example of this is the suicide rate in America drastically increasing during the stock market crash and the Great Depression that followed in the 1920s and 30s. The suicide rate jumped from 18% in 1928 to 22.1% in 1932. That 22.1% is still an all-time American high according to American Public Health Association. And finally, the suicide red tornado displayed, egoistic suicide. This occurs when there's low social regulation and low attachment to society. This suicide occurs when a person views themselves as a social outsider or outcast and find it difficult to find a place in a group. Reddy says, I had withdrawn from humanity because I had, in fact, lost my humanity. I had believed that without my humanity, there was little to no purpose to my continuing to exist. Showing his egocentric sense of alienation. This is comics, and Reddy was able to jump back into life when he chose, but know that if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. One thing sociology teaches you when you walk into 101, day one, is that even an outsider is a part of a group, even if they can't find that group. There are no new feelings, there are no new emotions, there are no new experiences, even if they are new for you. You are not alone. I've added the number to the National Suicide Hotline in the bonus episode show notes and encourage anyone feeling this way to use it. Back to. Reddy goes on to say that perhaps, just perhaps, there is still some human feeling left in him. When Superboy asks why, the tornado replies that the three teens annoy the hell out of him and he feels an urge to smack them, especially Impulse. He thanks them and says he's indebted to them. This is a strange way to go about owing a life debt, but there it is. And Robin says, you're welcome, I guess, before Impulse, who's been ignoring Tornado's speech and racing around the cavern the whole time, sprints towards the trio in the final panel, telling them that a message just came up on the monitors about something happening at a dig site nearby. And Superboy is delighted. He says, finally, some action. We get a large panel to open page 12 of the group racing through the city at night. Impulse in the lead on foot, as usual, followed closely by Superboy in the classic flying pose, with Reddy, both arms extended out in front of him, fist clenched, the lower half of his body engulfed in a tornado propelling him forward, and Robin on his back, close behind. Robin asks how Red Tornado knew all the things he does about him, and Tornado says he keeps files on over 1,500 super beings, also known as metahumans in the DC universe. Reddy goes on to say he has 19 files on Hawkman alone, a fourth wall shattering dig to the convolution of Hawkman's history in comic books. An impulse replies, that MacGuffin University sponsored the dig to explore a weird crater, and an artifact was discovered that zapped one of the archaeologists. Naming the university MacGuffin was pretty clever, little writer's humor, I like it. And in the final panel, they reach the dig site where news crews, police cars, and hordes of people have shown up. Superboy says, Imp, do me a favor. Don't give me straight lines like that. And I promise you, I have no idea what he means here. Maybe he's used to Impulse being random, or maybe they just needed somebody to say something for the final panel. I don't know. We're moving on. 13 opens to a massive crowd of reporters and photographers huddled together with their mics and cameras up, trying to get closer to the crater. But two men are stopping them. A short Asian man with black hair, a black suit and white tie, and a tall, bald black man with a full goatee and beard. The Asian man is holding his hands up, and he's not messing around with this crowd. He's telling them that he and his partner are in charge, and the next person who questions that is going to have their spine snapped. The black man is holding a hand cannon with both hands and he's telling the crowd that if they don't stay back, he'll be forced to shoot them for their own protection. 
So clearly, we've got a couple of cornball law enforcement agents using a threat of force under the guise of protection. I'm going to shoot you to save you. Abolish the police. In the next panel, a white daring blonde reporter dressed in a green suit with a soft yellow button up, using all of his privilege, steps in front of the crowd as the rest look on nervously, his cameraman a step behind him. He says he's Ace Atchison out of CDTV. He was on his way to cover a concert, but the crowd lured him over and he wants to know what's the haps before asking who the two men are. The man in a white suit says he's Special Agent Donald Fight, and his partner is Ashido Mad. As if being a cop of color wasn't corny enough, their names together are Fight and Mad. Fighting Mad, are you kidding me? Fight says the interview is over and raising the hand cannon, fires a shot into the final panel that barely misses Atchison, but destroys his cameraman's equipment. Art imitating life. 14 opens to Robin and company approaching a group of law enforcement agents in suits and a police officer holding a phone. Superboy tells Robin to check with a white guy with brown hair in a gorgeous gray pinstripe suit and black tie. Robin approaches him and asks the man who's in charge and if he's working for the FBI. The man says he's from the Department of Extra Normal Operations, but he's not running the investigation. In the next panel, the DEO agent points to Fight and Mad, saying that they are, but Robin wants to stay clear of them. Robin asks how come, of course. He's the boy wonder. He doesn't have to steer clear of much. And the agent replies, because they're fighting mad. That's why. Impulse isn't impressed. He puts his hand to his cheek and rolls his eyes in the next panel, saying, ooh, I'm so scared, before racing into the pit past Fight and Mad. Mad, his arms raised in outrage, screams, Hey, who's the dead kid who just ran past here? As if he could take Bart Allen. In the final panel, Impulse stops in front of a cordoned off area of the crater where a large shiny blue crystal is jutting from the earth in front of the extraterrestrial tire. He says the crystal looks like a cocoon and wonders what's inside. 15 opens to a murder attempt as Mad, as good as his word, pulls a pistol from his jacket and fires a shot at Impulse. But Superboy's not having that. Faster than a speeding bullet, he places himself between Impulse and the danger, and the bullet bounces off his chest, shouting that nobody pops one of his teammates. Mad replies that he was shooting to wound, but he could be convinced to shoot to kill. And the boy of steel snaps, lifting Mad off the ground in the next panel. He replies, oh really? Could I convince you to shove your head up your own? Fight steps forward before Soups can finish his sentence in the next panel, and lifting a wallet photo album filled with badges, says the operation is now being run by the government. Robin, grabbing the tail end of the photo wallet, reads through the list of agencies. What the heck? DEO? FBI? Interpol? CIA? Secret Service? Scotland Yard? Smirsh! For crying out loud! You can't have IDs from all those agencies! And Fight and Mad get more ridiculous by the second! Fight says, We're from the All-Purpose Enforcement Squad, Multinational Cooperative Task Force. We have more clearance than God. He must think that sounds cool. But it doesn't. Before Mad chimes in, screaming at Impulse, who is about to stick his head in the crystal off panel. The young speedster does in the next panel, and the crystal explodes in the final panel with a loud BRACOOM of the Ginyu Force. So you're gonna be corny too? Sorry. Back to 16 opens with Superboy tossing Mad to the side as he and Robin shout down into the crater, wondering if Impulse is okay. But Impulse is fine, and at Robin's shoulder in the next panel saying so. Robin says that was a stupid chance, and that if anyone is going to take stupid chances, it should be Superboy. Superboy, a little slow on the uptake, replies, Yeah, if anyone should... Wait a minute. And Robin says relax. He only meant that Superboy is less likely to misjudge before a cackle fills the air. In the final panel, we see what's become of Professor Dowd. Standing in the three-quarter full-body profile with her back to us, her long strawberry blonde hair now has streaks of blonde in it extending down past her waist. She's wearing a pink and purple skin-tight suit with gold running along her shoulders. The pink is running from beneath it, stopping at a point in the small of her back where the purple takes over until becoming pink at her thighs. A circular design pattern runs down her arms and legs in the pink, and now she has long red fingernails not present before. On the side of her face running down her cheeks and top of her back is a striped tiger-like pattern, and her ears have morphed into gold feline ears that are poking out of her hair on top of her head. Surrounded by smoke, she screams, Foolish males, once. Once I was mere Nina Dowd. But no more. Now I am mighty endowed. Are you? I'm serious. Her appearance has a great effect on the young heroes. Impulse falls to his knees, staring down at her, asking if they're supposed to fight her. And Superboy, both hands above his head on the other side of Robin, screams if there's a god, then yes. Robin says, wow, she certainly got huge tracts of land. What? I don't know, man. It's comic books. Let's keep rolling. Mighty endowed screams that she sees them up there trembling in fear. 
But Superboy, clearly attracted to her and in full-on creep mode, says it's not fear she's seeing, it's anticipation. Clearly Mighty Endowed, from her name and the way that they're covering them, has huge breasts, but we don't see them. In the next panel, her chest covered in smoke, she screams that she'll defeat them all with a fist raised before, I shit you not, waving both hands around in a slight panic trying to keep her balance. She screams she's too top heavy and falls on her face. Splayed out on the ground, she looks up at the trio. While Superboy in a circular final panel, his left hand on his face, a Kool-Aid grin on his lips says, Aw, that's what he says! Nerds! On 18, with the entire crowd's eyes and fight's hand cannon aimed on him, Robin says, Gentlemen, with all due respect, this might be something more up our alley. Why don't you authorize us to go down and check this out for you firsthand? Robin's a smart hero. I know he and his gang of heroes are going to handle this weirdness, regardless of what Fight and Mad say, but he pretends to give them a choice in the matter. Ace Atchison chimes in saying they can be trusted because they're the Teen Titans. Superboy says, no, we're not. Atchison switches up saying, oh, that's right. You're the Young Justice League of America. This time, Impulse corrects him. He says, no, we're young, but just us. This should be enough to settle confusion, but Atchison is lost in a distortion field of his own design. He calls them Young Justice, and Impulse, imagining an anvil falling on the man's head with an annoyed look on his face, corrects him again. No. Young. Just. Us. And now it's clear Atchison is just stupid or plays it really well because he repeats right. Young Justice. Impulse, tired of the who's on third slapstick routine, says fine. Whatever. In the next panel, Fight, with Mad by his side, tells Young Justice to check out the situation and see what's what. And Mad, living up to his name, snaps, asking his partner if the man's gone crazy. But Red Tornado knows what's up. Joining Young Justice's side, he says that Fight is using them for cannon fodder in case there is danger. You know Impulse isn't worried about that. He looks at Fight, says sounds, and is only after Flash in the final panel finishing his sentence, like a plan, while Robin and Superboy sigh together. I don't know why they're still always annoyed by this. It's literally the kid's name. The young heroes enter the pit to open page 19. Robin crouches down to investigate the tire. Superboy stands behind him, cracking his knuckles, and Impulse, completely disrespectful to Mighty and Dow, stands with his right foot on her butt and left on her head. Robin asks Superboy if he thinks he can pull the tire out, and Superboy replies that it won't be a problem with his tactile telekinesis. And Impulse snaps! Man, will you stop blabbering about your stupid power? You act like you're filling in someone who's just met you. Enough already! And of course, that's another subtle nod to us. The fourth wall in this comic book is being broken in very clever ways, and I appreciate it a lot. We've got McGuffin University. We've got Impulse constantly talking around the fourth wall. When he's done, Dowd asks if he minds. Like, put some cuffs on her or let her up, kid. In the next panel, it's Superboy's turn to snap. Calling Impulse whiz-bang, he tells the fastest kid alive to pull the tire out. But Robin weighs that idea away and tells Superboy to get it done. And Superboy rounds on Robin next, asking who left him in charge, and Robin says, look, don't go there. Superboy bends down to grab the tire, telling Robin that the boy Wonder isn't his boss, and Robin says, fine, all I want is the job done. In the final panel, Superboy activates his tactile telekinesis. What is that? Well, he can deconstruct things with a touch, separating them on impact, and used it in his early days to mimic many of Superman's powers. It's all very comic book, but suffice to say, in the beginning, all Superboy's powers were grounded in his tactile telekinesis. So when he grabs the tire and lifts it in the final panel, the sand and rock surrounding it separates easily from the tire. On 21, in a very cool looking panel, we see what the world belonged to. A futuristic two-seater motorcycle with five tires. The back cockpit has motorcycle handlebars. The front, a built-in cockpit with a control panel and all the bells and whistles. The bike is magenta with a stylized horizontal lightning strike across the bumper and large blue shaded headlights. Robin wonders aloud what the motorcycle is, and Superboy, holding it above his head, replies that whatever it is, it's his. He says he's going to call it the Supercycle, but Impulse doesn't like this idea at all. His arms folded, his back to his teammates in the next panel. He says, oh, like, I don't think so. Why should we ride around in something that gives you top billing? Robin says no one's riding around in anything, but he's already sitting in the thing. In the next panel, Superboy says the thing is weird because it's been buried for who knows how long, but it feels warm. And Robin wonders why First Contact turned Dowd into a Catwoman. Superboy thinks it was booby-trapped. Right before a flash of pink lights and spots illuminate Robin in the final panel as he says he thinks he just turned the thing on. 21 opens to Superboy mocking Robin saying, well, that was really using your head. 
giving Superboy orders, giving impulse orders, and then he's the one who messes up and activates the thing. But Robin tells him to shut up and help him get out of it as the bike starts revving up. Superboy and Impulse each grab a Robin arm in the next panel while Impulse asks why the boy Wonder can't get out of it himself. But Robin can't escape it. A strange force is holding him in place, and despite the young heroes tugging on Robin's arms hard enough to yank them from their sockets, Impulse and Superboy can't get him out. Superboy asks what are they supposed to do when a robotic voice from the vehicle says, Hold on. The three young heroes stare at the bike, Robin questioning aloud if it just spoke, and Superboy, seeing enough, says, Don't worry, I can force it to stay on the ground with my tactile telekinesis! As the bike launches out of the pit and into the sky in the next panel. In the final panel, Mad, his arms thrown out in front of him, wonders what the hell just happened. Reddy replies, Id, Ego, and Super Ego unleashed. I could explain it in more detail, but I'll need a slide projector and some charts. Take his shots! He didn't need all of those things to explain it to three teenage heroes, but he doesn't think Matt is smart enough to comprehend without a chart. I love it. Atchison, in the background with his arms folded, his right hand on his chin, spots the spray paint on Red Tornado's chest and thinks to himself, Hey, I like Hanson. Of course you do, bud. Of course you do. On the final page, we get a splash of all three young members of Young Justice on the bike. Surrounded by clouds, the city small beneath them, they race high into the night. Robin on the back seat gripping the handlebars with Superboy clutching the side. Hanging on for dear life stays left, both of them screaming wildly. The captain boxes surrounding them read, Meantime, as they rapidly approach the ionosphere, with the supercycle ignoring both Robin's guidance and Superboy's you-know-what, we find our team finally united in one thing. Pure, undiluted panic. While Impulse, a smile on his lips, one leg hanging out of the front cockpit where he's sitting says, Cool. The final caption box reads, For the most part. Another caption box tells us the next issue will be The Boy's Wild Ride or Splatter Mountain. And we're out. This comic is what a comic for kids should look like in my opinion. It's fun. The art is beautiful throughout. I didn't even want to waste time saying a gorgeous panel or another gorgeous panel. Much respect to Nauk and Stucker. Each member of the team has their own unique voice and they don't sound like adults. An issue that plagues a lot of teen driven comic stories. The Legion of Superheroes are mostly young teenagers, but in all the stories I seem to read, they talk much older than that. We don't have that issue here. Even Spidey's early comics can sometimes make Pete seem like a 30-something at times. Young Justice doesn't do that. It has an immature spirit woven into this series, and it never takes itself too seriously. I had so much fun going through this issue. Who knew Red Tornado would create the rabbit holes we fell through? Man, the psychology, man, the sociology, man takes shots at cops, and he's just an android. You would think he didn't have it in him, but he does. I don't have any other Young Justice issues, but I do have a near complete run of what I consider one of the best team books ever written, Teen Titans, written by DC's Man of Many Hats, Jeff Johns at the height of his comic writing duties, in which all three founding members of Young Justice are included. So we'll see them again along with a lot more diversity of people absent from this story. Thank you so much for being a patron. Thank you so much more for listening. It's because of you I get to do this and I never, ever take that for granted. Please like, please comment, please share, please take care, please think of the world and be true to yourself. And remember, with great power, you know you know the rest. Make sure you're being responsible. I'm out of here.